woman has rights. Those rights are the child's rights because everybody has the right to life. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I yield back. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 5th, 2011, the Chair recognizes the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. King, for 30 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's my privilege and honor to address you here on the floor of the House of Representatives and also to have um, listened in on the presentation over the previous hour, the uh, Republican Women for Life, led by Congresswoman Schmidt, who has uh, relentlessly uh, stood up for the innocent unborn. And I certainly support that cause and lend my voice to it, although I don't know that there's much uh, to be added after the presentation that I've just heard. I'm just thankful that it's in the congressional record and that uh, your ear has been tuned to it, Mr. Speaker, and that the ear of the American people are tuned to that message as well. I have a couple of subjects that I wanted to discuss here within the upcoming 30 minutes that's been allotted. And the first one is to speak to the vote that we've just had here on the floor on the continuing resolution um, for uh, extending the funding for this government for an additional three weeks, and it is known as a clean CR. Now, this House came together to work its will on H.R. 1. We debated that continuing resolution, which would be designed to fund this government for the balance of the fiscal year. Mr. Speaker, I think it's real important that um, you and the American people are reminded that we're in this condition of this debate over this continuing resolution because the Pelosi Congress didn't do business as directed and as, as framed under the Constitution of the United States. This, the Pelosi Congress continued to digress when it first uh, opened up here in January of 2007 after the majority and the gavel was passed right behind me where you are, uh, Mr. Speaker. The, um, this Congress functioned for the first few weeks pretty much the same as it had under the previous speaker. But in that transition that took place, the rules began to get changed, and uh, there were fewer and fewer opportunities for members to weigh in. The committees began to function less and less. More and more bills were written out of the speaker's office, and as this unfolded, the rules changed. It took away one of the things was an open rule under appropriations process so that members couldn't offer their amendments and force a debate and a vote on an issue uh, of their concern. Appropriations bills have always been the tool that allowed members to work their will on the package that came from committee. Well, that went away. That was taken, uh, it was taken away by, I, I just presume it was by order of the Speaker, uh, Speaker Pelosi. And so the House was no longer able to work its will. Bills came down under a closed rule. Appropriations bills came down under, uh, well, a modified closed rule. And then they didn't come down at all. Then they turned into omnibus spending bills, or they turned into uh, continuing resolutions, and this government limped along without having the opportunity to gather together from across this country the collective wisdom of the 435 members of Congress as informed by our constituents. And so the Congress became dysfunctional. And one of the things that, that is the result of that is the legacy today of having to be in this business now of seeking to put Congress back on its tracks again in the fashion that the Constitution frames and the tradition of functional Congresses direct us. That's been the mission of Speaker Boehner. And he's been very clear about this, to make this Congress work again. And because of that commitment, it brought about the debate on H.R. 1, which debated all the funding of the federal government for the balance of this fiscal year and allowed it under an open rule. There were hundreds of amendments that were offered by members that had four years of pent-up frustration, Democrats and Republicans alike, that had a voice that wanted to be heard, votes that we wanted to see cast, and a message that helped shape the, well, let's say, the political consensus of this body before a bill goes over to the United States Senate. And we worked through that bill for over 90 hours of debate. And of the hundreds of amendments that were offered, there were a good number that were passed. And some of them shut off funding to certain pieces of policy. But it was the will of the House wrapped up in the result of the passage of H.R. 1 that went over to the Senate. That was the first offer, and it's the best offer, of the House uh, so far. And it reflects the will of the House of Representatives, and the House of Representatives designed by definition to reflect the, reflect the will of the American people. And so I want to make it clear, Mr. Speaker, that we're in this debate 
and into this discussion over continuing resolutions, the continuing resolution that was passed in the lame duck session that carried this Congress until March 4th of this year, the two-week, quote, clean CR, close quote, uh, that it funded this government for two weeks and is set to expire on the night of March 18th. And now the extended, now three-week, quote, clean CR, close quote, uh, that extends the funding an additional three weeks under similar terms, not identical terms, to the previous continuing resolution. All right. That's the scenario that we're in, Mr. Speaker. And this, we're in this scenario because Congress wasn't doing its job from 2007 on up until... Uh, we gaveled in here in January of 2011. There was a four-year period of time where 2007, it wasn't too bad when it started. It digressed. It digressed progressively until it became as close to completely dysfunctional as a Congress. Uh, it has been, and at least as far as my understanding of this history. And I'd say, uh, Mr. Speaker, that I've lived a fair amount of it, and I've studied uh, the rest of it, although I wouldn't present myself as being a, con or a congressional scholar and historian and all the details. But that's generally what's taken place. Now we have Speaker Boehner putting this Congress back on the tracks. And yes, there were some growing pains going through those 90-plus hours of debate on the continuing resolution under an open rule. And yes, some of us compromised, many of us actually compromised, to, allow, to take our, our amendments down and negotiated a unanimous consent agreement that was negotiated in good faith. And I appreciate all the effort that went into that. It was a very, very good exercise. Democrats and Republicans alike, I heard no one uh, argue that the process of open rules and open debate was a bad process or that it wasn't fair or that it somehow should not have been done, that we should have engaged into a closed rule process. No, Mr. Speaker, that was the right thing to do. And the subsequent continuing resolutions, the first one for two weeks was designed to buy some time for the Senate to digest H.R. 1 and the one that passed here on this floor um, over my vote when I voted no on it um, is an extension of a similar philosophy with another little slice out of the cuts. So maybe, just maybe, the Senate will swallow this one bite at a time when the whole loaf seems to be too much. But on the other hand, the leverage is, is diminishing as the pages on the calendar turn. Mr. Speaker, I didn't come here tonight to um, belabor this issue, to, just to make the point that there's a reason that we're at this position with, uh, with debates over continuing resolutions, and it is because the Congress didn't function in previous years and handed over this CR scenario to be taken up by the 4th of March. And we're trying to resolve this with a Senate that has been cooperative and complicit in the downward spiral of the functionality of the House of Representatives. I'm not speaking on the functionality of the Senate, although I might not be complimentary of that either, should I dig into that, Mr. Speaker. So that's the scenario that we are in. It's brought about some leverage points. It puts the House in a position where if we choose to, we can, we can hold our ground and we can direct policy across to the Senate and through to the President of the United States. And we should all understand that when the majority leader in the United States Senate speaks, he's speaking in such a way that it's designed to be in a way, a mouthpiece for the president, a shield to protect the president from public criticism and to protect the president from the initiatives that start here in the House. If members of this House will make the argument that, that we can't pass legislation here that we believe in because Harry Reid won't take it in the Senate, we should be thinking in terms of the proxy for the president in the Senate is resisting the Republican initiative, which is the will of the people that was brought about by the 87 new freshmen that have come here to support the incumbent Republicans and passed and caused about the, the, all the gavels in the United States House of Representatives from passed from the hands of one party into the hands of the other party. That's what's happened, the will of the people. And Mr. Speaker, we have an obligation to carry out this will of the people that in conformance, though, with our best effort and our best judgment, and that works in consultation with Democrats, as it should. And it hasn't always been the case working across the aisle, and there have been times that I've been accused of that myself. And I'll be a little more open than I've been in the past. But in the end, the House should work its will. I stand on that principle, and I compliment the Speaker for laying that standard out. And it's not going to be an easy banner to carry. He knows that. He understands this organism of the House of Representatives. And uh, in spite of uh, all of the, the stress that's going on here, the House is positioning itself 
to work its will on the Senate. And working its will on the Senate is working its will through the proxy for the president and on towards the White House. If the president of the United States believes that all of the functions of government don't match up to his desire to protect his signature issue, Obamacare, the American people need to know that that's his priority. My priority is to repeal it, defund it, until such time as we can get a president to sign the repeal of Obamacare. And that's been my effort to first kill the bill and then work to repeal it. And we're about a year and a half into this effort. And I will continue my effort as intensively as I need to for as long as it takes till the day comes when we can actually celebrate free at last, free from uh, the yoke of the socialized medicine policy called Obamacare and free to exercise our liberty that I believe has been unjustly taken from us uh, by the legislation itself and two, two uh, federal courts have found it unconstitutional. Now, Mr. Speaker, I, that's, my, that's my little editorial here and I haven't worked out a smooth transition into the next subject matter, but it occurs to me as I stand here that it's been a little while since I've addressed you on the subject of immigration. And it's been a little bit quiet in the House of Representatives on the immigration issue. And so I want to raise this point and have this discussion. And it, and it is this, that we're looking at numbers that show still millions of illegals here in the United States, about 60% of whom came across the border illegally, about 40% of whom overstayed their visas. And it's odd that the number of illegals is reported by the Department of Homeland Securities to be less than it's been over the previous eight years that I've been here in this Congress. So when I came here, the number was 12 million. 12 million illegals here in the United States. And I've gone down to the border many times. I've sat in on hearings year after year, week after week, where expert witnesses come forward and testify. And they will testify that the, the net numbers of people that are interdicted coming across the border uh, and they'll, that they would perhaps stop one out of four of those. And it's not too hard to extra extrapolate those numbers three or four or five years ago would come to four million, four million illegal border crossings in a year, of which they contend that they stop about one out of four. I think they said perhaps we catch one in three or one in four. That would be the under oath testimony of one of the uh, representatives of the Border Patrol. I think that number um, uh, may or may not be higher now, but I would go down to the border and the agents down there would tell me 25 percent, 10 percent has to come first. A 10 percent effectiveness rate. Now, one could argue whether 10 percent is the right number, whether, and I hear numbers less than that too, or whether 25 percent is the right number. Well, what it says is that I don't think anybody contends that the effectiveness rate of our the, the full list of uh, border control officers we have all across our southern border is interdicting a number that would be approaching even half of those that attempt to cross the border. And those attempts to cross the border are probably down from the data that I've given you from four or five years ago. But think of four million illegal border crossings. Think of that, those attempts. Think of stopping uh, perhaps a million of them. And now there's three million in the United States in a year. And that three million number is going to grow. Now, some of them go back to their home country again, and they cross multiple times. That's true. But if we had 12 million illegals in 2003, and we have less than 12 million illegals today, according to Janet Napolitano's Department of Homeland Security, what happened to all those people? We were accumulating people for all of these last eight years. And if somehow, by some miracle, some mystery of nature of humanity, we don't accumulate illegals in America when we have large numbers of them coming in here. I suppose you could chalk it off to a death rate or a self-deportation rate. But, Mr. Speaker, we got to 12 million somehow. They came from somewhere. And people agreed that 12 million was the illegal number. At least it was the floor, not the ceiling. I've always thought it was higher. But if in the years prior to 2003, we accumulated 12 million illegals, and if we're watching 4 million illegal border crossings a year, that might even be a peak, and maybe that number's down by a third or so now. And a large percentage get into the United States, and a significant percentage of them stay here. The 12 million gets to be a bigger number, not a smaller number. How did Janet Napolitano come with a number lower than 12 million? And that's a question I'd like to ask her if she'd stop before the immigration subcommittee so we could have that conversation. 
But I think the number is larger than 12 million. I've always thought it was larger than 12 million since I've been in this Congress. And I don't think the, that reduction shows the real population that's here. And as we look at the enforcement ratio that they show us on the southern border, it will show that they're stopping fewer and fewer illegals on the border. And the Department of Homeland Security contends that because there's less interaction with our agents and illegals, that that says that there are fewer illegals. Well, that might be the case, but it also might be the case that there's just less arrests, fewer interdictions. But I do think that when you double the number of Border Patrol agents, which we've done and then some on the southern border, they're out there competing uh, for to be able to make those arrests and make those pickups. So I think the natural order of our law enforcement officers will be doing, uh, uh, they'll still be doing the enforcement. But also it pushes people out away from those highly concentrated enforcement areas, those areas like El Paso, for example, and puts them through places in the desert that aren't watched as closely. So I asked the question, I used to hear testimony that would show that there were several hundred people that uh, died in the desert coming, try, sneaking into the United States. And as a, that number would grow, it would be 200 a year, then 250 a year. And a number that I recall that went up to 450 a year. And now that's data that's more than five years old, and I haven't been able to get my hands on that old data, but I do remember. And so if the number of deaths in the desert is going down, that would indicate that there are fewer people going through the desert if the climate hasn't changed, and other factors being all the same. But if the number of deaths in the desert to illegals is going up, that would indicate the traffic is going up. And so in a number of the sectors, we've seen those deaths go down. But in the Tucson sector, most recently, we've seen the number go up, which would indicate a larger number of illegals coming into the United States through the Arizona desert. As I traveled across New Mexico, the people there in a town hall meeting in Columbus, New Mexico said almost unanimously that they believe there are more drugs coming through and more illegals coming through than they've seen before. And they believe that it's more dangerous for them than it's been before. That, Mr. Speaker, is the circumstances on the border. And in any case, whether we have 11 and a half million illegals here or whether we have 20 and a half million illegals here, I don't believe the number is shrinking. I think the number still grows. We know we have more, we have a significant number of illegal entries into the United States. We don't have operational control of the whole border. We may have operational control of segments of the border, but there's much of it that we do not have. We've got a long ways to go, but I do believe, I believe that we can get operational control of the border. And I mean the operational control of the border that's defined in the Secure Fence Act that was pushed through this Congress by Congressman Duncan Hunter of California, whose son now serves in this Congress, and I'm grateful that he does. And I want to do honor to Duncan Hunter's work that passed the Secure Fence Act. I want to complete that project because these are some other things that I know. We're spending about $12 billion. Let me see if I can get these numbers right. About $12 billion on our southern border. And that turns out to be about $6 million a mile. Six million dollars a mile. Mr. Speaker, I think about what is a mile? That's four laps around an old track. Um, where I live in Iowa, it's to my west corner, any other corner for that matter. Uh, our roads are laid out in, mile, in a mile grid pattern, every section, mile to the corners, and there's a, there's a survey pin in the center of every intersection that's a mile apart each way. Surveyed the old way, and they got a lot of it very, very close. A mile. Six million dollars a mile for every mile, all 2,000 miles of our southern border. Six million dollars a mile. And we're guarding that border with a 10% or 25% or maybe even a higher efficiency rate, but not up to 50%. And we think we're getting our money's worth in doing that. And it doesn't mean that the agents aren't doing their job. It is tactically, are we investing the right dollars into the right resources to get the best result that we can? And so I look across my West Mile, for example, and I think, what if, what if Secretary of Homeland Security Janet Napolitano came to me and said, um, Steve, I'm going to make you an offer. I'll make you an offer for a contract for you to guard a mile. How about a mile by my house? Guard that so that people that, that want to cross it cannot cross it unless they're authorized, and if they are, direct them to a port of entry. 
and I'm going to pay you $6 million next year to see to it that no more than, say, oh, 75% of the people that try get across. That's what we're looking at. If it's a 25% efficiency rate at our southern border, that means 75% of those that try are getting through. And I admit, it's a little bit old testimony, but not that old, Mr. Speaker. And it has changed in some of the sectors, but not all of them. So I'm picking a number that's the most recent congressional testimony that I know of, and that's a 25% efficiency rate, which was, some thought, a stretch then. So it's a 75% inefficiency rate. So if Janet Napolitano came to me and said, I have this offer for you, here's $6 million, guard that west mile of your house, and you can only let 75% of the people that illegally want to cross it go across. The other 25%, you've got to turn them back. Would I take that deal? for that level of efficiency, especially if it's a 10-year contract, and should now it's $60 million for 10 years, I would just hope I could live long enough to spend it all. Yes, I'd take them up on that. And now, now if the offer was, you're going to get your $60 million for your mile, $60 million over 10 years for a mile guarding a mile of the border, you'll get your $60 million, but you have to provide efficiency, and you don't get to build empire. And you're not going to grow a, an empire that gives you political clout by, by hiring a lot of people and giving them good benefits package and marketing it off in that fashion. You're going to have to make the best efficiency with it you can. I would look at that mile, and here's what I'd do, Mr. Speaker. I would pick up the Duncan Hunter proposal, and I'd say, let's build a fence, a wall, and a fence. Let's build a fence, a wall, and a fence across that mile, and I'd put the capital investment in, and for a couple of million dollars a mile, I'd have that all done. For about a third of my first annual budget, I'd have that all done, and it would cut my costs on the, on the guard and manpower costs for the duration of the decade and beyond. If you'd build a fence, a wall, and a fence that would, you'd amortize it and depreciate it out over about 40 years, and it would yield benefits every single year. They built that kind of a barrier in Israel, and it's 99 point something percent effective. If you look around the world, there's fence after fence after fence. And the people over on this side of the aisle, as a rule, they will say, well, don't you know that we don't do that? Don't you know that the Berlin Wall is abhorrent to us? And my answer to that is, where, how did you get history so distorted in your mind that you would compare a fence to keep people out with a fence to keep people in? There are two opposite proposals, two opposite reasons. You can't convince, a, you, can't, you can't argue that the Berlin Wall is like building a fence on our southern border unless you want to argue that the people that were in the west wanted to get over that wall into the east. They did not. There was no traffic sneaking in behind the Iron Curtain. It was the other way around. And so we're trying to keep large masses of people out of the United States and force them all through the ports of entry and let them come in here the legal way. And there is no country in the world that's more generous than the United States. In fact, all the countries in the world don't match up to the generosity of the United States from an immigration perspective. So we're generous. We bring in about one and a half million people a year legally. And we watch as every night we have, we have dozens and hundreds of people that come into the United States. And one calculation showed during the peak of this, 11,000 a night. 11,000 on a, a 24-hour period. Most of that's at night. You know, the Santa Ana's Army was only about five to 6,000. It was nearly twice as large as Santa Ana's Army every single night. No, they weren't in uniform, and a lot of them weren't carrying guns, and maybe they weren't a physical threat to us in a, in a, in a general sense. But that is a pretty large group of people every night to see twice the size of Santa Ana's Army coming into the United States illegally. And I will tell you, I believe it's at least the size of Santa Ana's Army now every night. And we're letting this happen day by day by day, and we turn a little blind eye to it, and we watch as we tragically pick up the bodies in the desert of those that are sneaking into the United States illegally, that don't make it across that desert. And as the summer comes along, the numbers go up and up. But I asked the question a few years ago, when they were testifying before the Immigration Committee, about how many lives were lost in the desert sneaking into the United States, how many Americans died at the hands of those who made it into the United States? How many times have we seen fatalities on the highway that was someone who didn't have a driver's license, didn't have an insurance policy, that was in the United States illegally, that didn't understand our laws, that uh, drinking and driving had been picked up, had been interdicted by law enforcement? Uh, we, lost a, we lost a nun in Virginia last year. 
very close to home. Corey Stewart uh, knows about that, the county supervisor down there, and uh, I believe it's Prince William County. That's an example. We lost several kids in a school bus wreck in southwest Minnesota, north of me, that happened with, a, with, a, with an illegal that had been interdicted several times and turned loose into our society. And those families grieve for their lost children in a school bus wreck that would have been avoided if we'd enforced our laws at the border, if we'd enforced our laws with local law enforcement here in the United States when we come across people that are in the United States illegally. This is not a big ask. A sovereign nation has to have borders. And what do borders mean? They mean that you control the traffic that's coming into those borders, and we could actually decide you would control the traffic going out of the United States, but we don't have to do that because we've developed a pretty good country here. And we're going to lose this country if we don't adhere to the rule of law. And the rule of law is that when this Congress acts, the executive branch is bound to enforce the law, and it's a prudent decision that reflects the will of the American people. The American people have said, we want our borders secure, and we don't want workers in the United States illegally taking jobs away from Americans or legal immigrants who become Americans. We want to have a tighter labor supply than that. If we wanted to up our 101.5 million legal immigrants into the United States, we could do that. We could double this. We could triple it. We could go tenfold. We could say that anybody could come to the United States. All you have to do is is sign up at the um, U.S. Council in, your home, in, the, in the U.S. Embassy in your home country. And we'll send you, in, we'll give you a visa to come to the United States. We can say that. You could, we could bring anybody in that wanted to come in. But why do we say no? Because there's a limit. We have asked the question here in this Congress, in a previous Congress, has asked and answered the question, first, how many are too many? And what kind of people do we want to encourage to come here? And what kind of people do we want to discourage from coming here? These are the questions. And we have all kinds of people involved in this debate that, have, that don't have the slightest idea how to begin to answer those questions. They just say, oh, my compassion compels me to be for open borders. My heart bleeds for people that aren't as fortunate as Americans are. So therefore, I'm just going to be for turning a blind eye or granting amnesty so that I don't feel guilty that there, everybody can't live on the American dream like we all do. Well, things have changed. Things have changed. There was a time when we had high levels of immigration into this country and zero welfare state. When my grandmother came over here in 1896, no, excuse me, 1894, when she came over here, we weren't a welfare state. They, they screened people when they, before they got on the boat, and they checked them out physically. They checked them out mentally. They made, if they had a lot of resources, they got, a, they got to ride first class and got unloaded in a different dock, but the rest of them went to Ellis Island. And even though they screened a good number of the people out before they boarded the ship, and remember, they didn't want to haul them back to Europe. That was Europe primarily at that time. But even still, after they were screened and they arrived at Ellis Island, they gave them a physical, they looked in their eyes, they gave them a kind of a quick mental test. They looked underneath their eyelids to see if they had a disease that put little white spots underneath there. And if they weren't a physical, if they weren't a physical ability or mental ability to be able to take care of themselves, they put them back on the boat, I should say ship, and sent them back to the place where they came from. And about 2%, 2% were sent back. Now, here we are, we're interdicting 10%, 25%. We don't even get that many sent back because it's round robin. For a long time, we did catch and release, and we said, come back and appear. Uh, and, of course, they didn't appear. And then we did catch and return. Pick them up at downtown Nogales, take them up to the, 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 the um, station sector uh, location, and they would come in with their little Ziploc bag. We'd fingerprinted them, took the digital photograph of them, and sometimes we saw that same person come back. The peak uh, one that I know of down there was in 27 times. That's a really, you know, we had a really good return trade going on with people that were coming into the United States illegally. We'd pick them up, give them a ride up to the, to the, the, the headquarters, and uh, all they had to do was just have their prints taken again, get their picture taken again, and then they got a little van ride that was down to the port of entry where they turned that little white van sideways, open up the side door, and they'd get out and walk back to Mexico. The van would take off and go get another load. Around and around and around we went. It, it, was, it was round robin. 
and it wasn't accomplishing very much. Now we're at least bringing prosecution against most of them, which is providing a little more of a deterrent, Mr. Speaker. But we've got to do a lot, lot better. We've got to understand this mission. The mission is to protect our borders for this sovereign nation. You can't have a border if you don't control the border. We need to control the border and all of it. We need to force all traffic through the ports of entry. And we can do it if we build a fence, a wall, and a fence. And yes, we need to put sensory devices up there and use some of the other technology that's there. And yes, we have to have border, control, border patrol agents that are there that are manning the fence and running to the, to the locations where they need to to make the proper interdictions. All of that needs to take place. But we need to use our resources smartly, and we can. We can shut off all illegal traffic it's going coming Gentlemen, across our southern expired. border if, if we do these smart things. And I have not advocated, I'll point out, Mr. Speaker, I haven't advocated a 2,000-mile fence. I've simply advocated that we build a fence, a wall and a fence, and build it till they stop going around the end. That's the standard. And force all the traffic through the ports of entry. Then we have to widen our ports of entry, beef them up so that we can handle the increased traffic that's there so that it's not a significant Gentleman's impediment. Time expired. Excuse me, Mr. Speaker. The gentleman's time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In that case, a uh, bit of a surprise to me, but I'd yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back.
What purpose does this gentleman from Texas seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I send to the desk a privilege report from the Committee on Rules for filing under the rule. Clerk will report the title of the resolution. Report to accompany House Resolution 170. Resolution providing for consideration of the bill, H.R. 839, to amend the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act of 2008 to terminate the authority of the Secretary of the Treasury to provide new assistance under the Home Affordable Modification Program while preserving assistance to homeowners who were already extended an offer to participate in the program, either on a trial or permanent basis, and providing for consideration of the bill, H.R. 861, to rescind the third round of funding for the Neighborhood Stabilization Program and to terminate the program. Referred to the House calendar and ordered printed. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas for a motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I uh, ask that the House do now adjourn. Uh, the question is on the motion to adjourn. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The motion is adopted. Accordingly, the House stands adjourned until 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. Hour for debate. The House today approved a short-term federal spending bill funding the government and government programs through April 8th.